Um, never mind. I'm all set. Okay. Thank you. So I'll go ahead and make a few comments and then Rich, if you want to jump in and, and say a few things, but um, the start to a possible fall athletic season has been, um, let's just say the planning of it has been less than smooth as we've looked at what has happened across the state. Um, and I think everyone here in this room and I don't, and there's Zoom call, I don't need to go over it, but know that this has been, I think a time of starts and stops. And when we think things are gonna be heading in one direction, they change and they go in another direction. And um, even as late as last week, uh, the Maine Principals Association was reporting that a school board vote was required for uh, the implementation of interscholastic play, which was not in fact the case. Um, the school board does not need to vote to approve that. Um, however, given all that we've done in reopening and given all the planning that we've done, uh, I thought it was important and working also with board leadership that we have an opportunity for the board to have a discussion and for the community to weigh in. And, and specifically within this motion, we're looking at whether or not students at Wyndham High School um, at the moment, whether or not that they should be participating in interscholastic play. And just a shorthand for interscholastic play is going beyond the fields of uh, Wyndham and Raymond and then playing in other districts. Uh, and so you have seen in the in across the state, there's been a couple school districts that at this point have said uh, they will not be holding interscholastic season. They will be doing things intramural or will be providing activities for their students, but they won't be playing other schools. So really tonight's discussion and tonight's vote is thinking whether or not RSU 14 students should be uh, participating interscholastically. Uh, I know there might be some questions from some board members. I've sent some things to you in your packets. Uh, Rich is also here as a resource to be able to share what this might look like for our students. And so, Jenny, I will leave it at, at that. Okay, thank you. So, Rich. Yes, thank you, Jenny. And um, to start the meeting, I know that somebody referenced everybody Usually everybody's Zoom meeting, it starts out with somebody saying, can you hear me? But I have had some warnings come across my screen that I'm having audio trouble. So I'm gonna ask him, just give me a thumbs up. Is everything okay? All right, thank you. So Mr. Howell's um, introduction and everything was great because as I referenced last week when I presented to the board, this is something as to get fall athletics off the ground has been something that has really been a daunting task, but it's been a task that um, we've taken head on and it's a task that we feel is um, worth doing for the kids. Um, it is something that has come very quickly in the sense that we all knew the dates were, were coming. We had the deadlines as far as when sports can start and everything like that. But we were really planning a season with no guidance. And guidance really came about um, last Thursday. We really kind of pulled it together. We um, are following the guidance and not only Wyndham High School, but all schools are following the guidance. So. Um, schools might do things a little bit differently here and there in-house, but really the guidance is the guidance for all schools to return to play. Um, so we've implemented it. We've done training with our coaches. We've met with our kids. We have um, have protocols in place. And here we are in day three. And I just think it's right now, uh, proper and, and the right thing to do to reference the kids uh, first and foremost because the kids have been nothing less than fantastic. I have not heard a peep out of them negative wise. Casey and I have been in every session to kick off to uh, to get them back up and running and, and to talk about protocols and things of that nature. The coaches have held Zooms with the programs to go over uh, what's coming, pertinent information. So um, back to the kids, they should be commended. I, I'm looking at the participants and I know a few of them are on here and that's great, um, but a huge, huge shout out to those kids. 
the coaches as well, um, because they're in the trenches with the kids. But last week when I presented, I talked a lot about our protocols and, and things that are in place um, for the kids. And I just wanted to take a quick minute Mr. Howell, is it appropriate if I bring up my screen and share that document that I created? Yeah, let me make you a co-host so you can share. Yeah. Should be okay now, Rich. All right. Just want to mention for board members, you have this document in your board packet. I assume, Chris, everybody can see this. I just want to double check. Looks good, Rich. All right, thank you. Um, you know, we again, we've talked about protocols and we've talked about safety and everything, but there's been a lot of questions of, Rich, what does each sport, what, what's it going to look like? And what I did is I really just kind of mapped out each for real quickly what it's going to look like and really what is in the MPA guidance. Um, and I, I'm just going to go through here quickly because I know um, there could be questions and comments, um, but I just want to start off with cross country. Cross country and golf are somewhat uh, grouped together. They're low risk activities, but they're considered level five activities, which really means they can compete at a regional and statewide level. They will have championships, they will have a possible state championship. Um, and they're really the only two sports, or I shouldn't say really, they are the only two sports that will be competing for a state title uh, due to the guidelines that are in place. But more in particular, if you look at cross country, here are some things that our cross country kids what their season could look like. Um, we're, we, we have one of the best cross country courses in the state, um, but it's not really COVID compliant. Um, so our meets this year are gonna be on the road. When I say that, I don't necessarily mean the hot top. They're gonna be at, at Gorm, Chevres, Bon Eagle, and Scarborough. You can see the teams that we compete with. The biggest reason why our course is not um, in compliance is we have some areas where it's uh, the width is six feet or under and really for that to happen safely for a course to happen and a race to happen you need that distance but some things that are in place for cross country you're going to be seeing some staggered starts instead of everybody at the start of a race with a gun going off they're going to be staggered starts and also the finish line um, the finish line can in during normal times can be very, um, I don't want to say unorganized, but it's chaotic. Uh, the finish lines are going to be very much a social distance when the kids come across and they're go going to the race administrators are going to be getting the kids out of the way. Um, there'll be no signs of traditional celebration. We've seen all kinds of fist bumps, chest bumps, high fives, hugs. Um, those days for right now are on hold. There's gonna to have to be, be a lot of air high fives. Face coverings are recommended, but not when engaged in vigorous activity. Um, our school will compete in four meets prior to regionals. Teams have to arrive in a self-sufficient manner, meaning that they're equipped and pretty much ready to go um, when we travel. Athletes will be responsible for their personal supplies. And we talked a little bit about this last week, but the biggest thing is, is water. We're not talking so much first aid supplies, but we're talking water and things of that nature that are really their own items, a towel and, and things. The governor's executive order, which I'll talk about a little bit later tonight, but it's in mass gathering for outside. Um, the, that executive order is in place for events all events and it's at a hundred people at that gathering. So that's in place for cross country. Staff provides meet and greet protocols. So when we host an event here at Wyndham High School, Casey or myself, as we always do, but we'll continue to do, 
We'll greet the teams when they show up on our campus. The first thing we'll do is welcome them, but we'll also address um, COVID protocols that are really in place for to let them know and be familiar with our facility. The protocols that we'll brief teams on are really protocols that they're familiar with because a lot of the schools are doing the same things. And sanitizers provided for all um, participants. These are just some highlights of some changes for cross country. I'll go on to golf, which is very similar. Just one second. Could we yeah. can I go back to um, when you said teams arrive in self-sufficient manner. Can you tell me what that means? That means, um, Jenny, that they're basically ready to go, that they're ready to race, they're prepped. Um, you know, they have their spikes just ready, you know, sweatshirts that they're not okay. showing up undressed. They're All right, but, I'm sorry, but um, <clears throat> does that mean they go home first? A lot of our departure times are going to be later, so there will be time for kids to prep and do that between transportation, uh, between school releasing and transportation and the bus departure. Yes. Okay, so they will go home, change, come ready to be in the meet, get on the bus, and then go to the thing. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Golf is much of the same. Um, and you can see some of the information is, is there. The, the piece with golf, the golf has really been one of the items the, from the get-go through the USAG rules that has been allowed to, to start um, this spring. But some things that are in place specifically that I just want to reference, um, kids won't be touching flag sticks, bunker rakes, Teas and pencils, uh, sanit sanitized paper cards will be provided and electronic scoring. So just trying to limit the, you, the ability to touch items that you could pick something up on. Um, kids won't be allowed to use carts, sanitizers provided. And again, staff provides meet and greet and protocols. Um, one of the big thing that uh, I'll just go back uh, midway through is the limit of the pro shop and snacks and congregating after the rounds. That's kind of a big thing. We're going to be kind of whisking the kids away and, and getting them prepped to when they come to the course, they have everything ready to go. Now we're gonna move on to field hockey. Field hockey is a model, moderate risk sport. It's level four and level four basically means that um, there's not statewide competition for a state championship. It's more localized, geographic. You can compete against uh, schools from adjacent counties. But these are some schools that we're going to play. Um, I want to reference SV is Sakopee Valley. So some of these schools traditionally are out of our conference. We're in the SMAA, Southwestern Maine Activities Association. These two schools, Sakopee Valley and GNG, Gray New Gloucester, are in the Western Maine Conference. So one of the big things when we went through this is it was really imposed upon us to regionalize schedule, scheduling to reduce travel. So that's something that the athletic directors have really uh, tried to do to do that because with busing, uh, everybody knows that uh, busing is an issue and, and something that really needed to happen in order for school to return. It's the same thing for athletics. Um, we are at 26 P, uh, kids on a bus, including coaches. So we are going to have to do some shuttling of trips. So for instance, if field hockey is playing at Westbrook, the bus would take the varsity over first, drop off the varsity, come back, uh, pick, back pick up the JV, go back. The varsity game will be finishing, bring the varsity back to Wyndham High and then go back to Westbrook, get the JVs and bring those kids back. So there's a lot of moving, a lot of moving parts, but it's parts that it's a team and Mike Kelly, I can tell you has been great to deal with and has been over backwards to make this happen for the kids. 
And again, some of these last few items are very similar to golf and cross country, that they're the same expectations. Teams arrive in sufficient manner. Athletes are responsible for personal supplies. The governor's executive order for 100 people. Uh, sanitizing. One thing here, I will be daily. I will find out the officials, uh, who they are, um, who is working our game, and I will call up the officials daily and put them through a self-screening piece to make sure that the health uh, piece is, asked, is covered, and also our game personnel, people who might be doing the PA or the clock, they will be going through screening as well. All, it's still on field hockey. All participants will be wearing masks in the bench area. No signs of traditional celebration. For field hockey, if anybody has ever watched a field hockey game or anything, sometimes in the past, past years, pre-COVID, um, you could really sub quite a few kids at one time. Now, um, due to tight quarters and close proximity to the scores table and getting kids in, the team is allowed one substitution at a time. So this was a little bit of a change to, to help with the accommodations in the game. Um, game personnel will be wearing masks and also field hockey's gone to quarters and they will be giving extra time for kids to get water and sanitize and things of that nature because it's just, they need extra time, it's something new. Moving on to, yes. Rich, before you move on, I noticed Scott had a question. Yes, Scott. Um, Rich, I wanted to ask real quick, um, I'm, and I apologize. I, I kind of want to cycle ba circle back to uh, golf and cross country. Yes. You mentioned uh, staggered times. Uh, the kids are going to be coming in off the buses. They're going to be ready to go, right? That staggered as far as the bus departure time scott yes leaving so they're basically going to they're going to have an opportunity to go home and then come back and then depart from the school yes all our bus departure times right now um, are pushed back and we're still working on that because schedules are um, still being finalized but a lot of our departure times will allow time for kids after school to do that, Scott. Okay, so here's where I'm, have you guys factored in sunset? Because if you, I mean, we're losing about three minutes a day. So if you're doing a staggered cross country with four different schools and say there are uh, 30 athletes for every single uh, school, uh, it's going to be pretty hard to run a cross country race or finish up a golf match um, at 6.45 or 7 o'clock when the sun sets at about 6.08 yep. come September, uh, October 10th. Cross country has gone to straight dual meets where it will be two schools competing, which will help immensely. Yep. And, and with, with golf, it's your top five. So it's a top five, like, uh, for instance, basketball starting five. It's your top five kids. They'll tee off. And traditionally, those starting times are right around 3.30, and they play nine holes. So they should be, um, in the time frame, they should be able to finish. Okay, that makes sense. All right, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Um, uh, moving on to soccer. Soccer, again, is very similar to field hockey. It's a moderate risk. It's a level four. Um, much like field hockey, there won't be state playoffs due to it being level four. It's regionalized. And these are some teams, or I shouldn't say some, these are the teams that our soccer team uh, will compete against. And these are some changes that people can see um, that's going to play, take place in the sport of soccer. Um, face masks are, are required when not engaged in, in uh, physical activity. Staff, um, Casey and I will, again, provide meet and greet protocols. Teams arrive in sufficient manner. Um, governor's executive order, 
sanitation officials, all participants wearing masks in the bench area, signs of traditional celebration. These are these last few are changes for this year. They won't stay in place once we hopefully get out of this pandemic, but slide tackling has been a, a uh, I don't want to say necessarily an art, but it's been a tactic that's been used in the game of soccer for quite some time. Slide tackling is suspended if within six feet of one another. Throw-ins and corner kicks. Um, if you think of, you know, a game that you've seen, uh, coaches and all soccer people use a throw-in and, and a corner kick as an offensive tactic. And Defensively, you can really, with 11 people on the field, you can pack it in and offensively, you can get in there as well. And sometimes you could have 20 people in the box. The um, new way that it's going to be approached that is in the box. When there's throw-ins and corner kicks, there'll be five offensive and five defensive players to limit the, the, uh, the amount of people in that area. Indirect and direct kicks. Um, if you've ever seen that before, the famous, you know, make a wall, make a wall, that's no longer going to be um, allowed. They have to be, uh, there has to be three feet in between the players when they attempt now to make a wall. And the drop ball restarts have been suspended. So soccer is going to look, I don't want to say pretty different, but it's going to look different because those are some big changes. Um, in the sport of soccer. Those are the sports that I wanted to reference that have changes. The next two sports that I'm going to move on to is two sports that have been, let's just say for lack, lack of a better term, canceled um, for the time being. Uh, and I'll start with volleyball. Rich, people. Can, before you start, can I ask a quick question? Because it's come up in each one of the sports. Yes. Um, on, on the governor's, where would it go? Um, the limit of 100? Yes. Are you going to talk about that later? Or can I ask that now? How, what, if there is a plan in place on how you are going to maintain that? Yep. I, I was going to talk about it later, Marge. That's fine. That's, I'll wait. I'll wait. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, volleyball has been postponed to the spring of 2021 uh, through the MPA. It hasn't been assigned any dates as of yet. It will be in the spring. There is a commitment to make that happen for the kids. But also right now, um, volleyball kids can meet with their coaches, can work out with their coaches. And a lot of schools are taking advantage of that. And we are, we're going to do that as well. And um, we're gonna call it some skills and drills, but even though it's skills and drills and not necessarily a interscholastic season where they're competing, they're still going to adhere to the protocols that are in place. Um, we've met with the coaches already, Casey and I, they are looking to start next Monday. We're gonna meet with the kids, um, the coach, and everybody will do everything um, correctly, almost as if the competitive season was going on in regards to the protocols to make sure that we're doing everything correctly. Um, the difference with this is they'll be outside. And uh, like I referenced, they'll be meeting Monday. So right now we have some portable nets that um, the coach owns and he's gonna be bringing them to school we're going to be finding a place on campus where they can get together um, in the grass and they're going to get together and, and they're going to make the best of it, knowing that their season is going to happen a few months down the road. And I just wanted to reference that because I think it's very important um, because that was one of the sports that was, I, I hate saying canceled, I'll, I'll use the term delayed. I'd like to talk about football next, and this is our football plan, and I think Co Coach Perkins is here as well, so, um, but this is something that his staff and, and coach has really gotten together to, uh, to put together for the kids, and, and this is something that really um, meets the standards and the guidelines and the expectations that is set forth 
by the NPA, but I'd like to say the first line is very, very important. And the NPA has said publicly that tackle football will be played this spring. I don't know when, I don't know how. Um, we, it's obvious our climate is gonna be a factor, but they've said publicly that they're gonna make a commitment to have tackle football play this fall if indeed it's safe to do so. So um, that's something that I'd like to note, and it's been on many media sources, so I'm sure everybody's heard that. Committees are starting to meet on what this will look like. It's a little bit different than volleyball. They were a little more definitive and, and, and uh, provided more information with volleyball and gave you know an approximate start date. Football was it will happen in the spring and we're gonna to try to make it happen. So it, it, to me, it was a little bit different, but what we're looking to do is start tomorrow with, with a team orientation meeting and Coach Perkins would like to get together with the kids on September 21st. Um, the kids, not only football, but all our athletic teams for right now, our cardio room and our weight room is not going to be utilized by our athletes. More specific, football, there will be no helmets, there will be no shoulder pads. We'll break up the kids. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought there was a question. We'll break up the kids with big skill work and small skill work. Team meetings will be conducted outside or via Zoom. And we'll lean on guest speakers heavily. This is something that, um, you know, to get a guest speaker pre-COVID was kind of tough because you had to do airfare and things like that and the hotel and accommodations. It's pretty easy to get a high level guest speaker nowadays via Zoom. So there's a lot of options and the staff is working on that. Looking at Monday, Wednesdays will be strength days with an offensive component. Tuesday, Thursdays will be speed days with a defensive component. Fridays will be a leadership development day and a competition day where they will develop competitions within the team that um, meet the standards and the expectations of, of the guidelines that we have to follow. We met last night with the football kids and the staff to, to go over protocols and to talk about kind of what the season could look like and it was great. We had over 50 people on the uh, Zoom session and the kids. It was great to see them. Uh, one thing that I'd like to reference, and this came out, and, and Mr. Howell did a great introduction. This came out uh, last Friday at 3.44 p.m. Um, that the MPA has endorsed and will sponsor Hey, Rich, before you go on, um, my computer has frozen and I can't mute people, but if anyone's on here and is not speaking, um, if you could just go ahead and mute yourself so that Rich isn't feeding back. Thank you all for doing that. It's a good drink break, Chris, so <laughs> that's perfect. Um, I have a question about football. Are you? Yes, um, tell me, but if you can't get in the the um, weight room, how can you do strength training? We are going to be. Um, I shouldn't say we. The football staff is going to be pretty pretty creative. They've already made some calls to the National Guard to lock in some tractor tires, and some sandbags and some things of that nature. Cool. Um, a certain sandbag will be assigned to that kid and that will be his sandbag. Um, so we're, they're really much, very much thinking outside the box. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Um, the MPA has endorsed 7v7 for competition. And what we'd like to do is to pick up two to three schools for, for those games and events. And I just have to, 7v7 is um, the best way I can explain it. It's straight passing. There's no tackling. There's no offensive, defensive lines um, going at it to create gaps for kids or anything like that. The point system is worked around um, catches and 
you get a different point value, and of course you try to score a touchdown. Um, Coach Perkins is on this, and, and Chris, I don't know if you can give him rights to speak. He can speak to it a little bit more in depth, um, but it is something that the seven on seven is really something that all the agencies has agreed, has agreed to that it is a safe event and a safe, um, uh, you know, uh, something that the kids could do that meets the standards for competition for football this fall. Um, Coach Perkins, are you there? I am. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Could you speak quickly just to sure. give the audience what this would look like real quick? Absolutely. And thanks for having me. I'm glad because I had somebody ask me the other day, hey, does seven on seven mean seven kids are in pads playing against each other? No. I mean, like Rich said, there's no pads. There's no contact. Uh, it's an instructional base. As simple as you can say, there's no running game. You have somebody throwing it, somebody trying to catch it, and somebody trying to defend it. Uh, it's something that we do in the summers because it's a no contact thing in the summer. And it's a great chance to instruct kids and coach them up on the game. So it's a very safe thing that we do every summer with our kids without pads then too. Thank you, Matt. So that's our football plan and that's what we plan to do. Um, Coach Perkins also has in place some special things. Uh, uh, I shouldn't say special, that too, but it's some things that some seniors are going to have to work on, and it's around the classroom. So that's a nice component as well. I'd like to talk a little bit about our cheerleaders, who um, I'm going to, to say they deserve a little bit of, of an apology, because when this was all rolled out by the Maine Principals, Maine Principals Association, they never referenced cheering. They never referenced what cheering could do, what they couldn't do. And it was very much uh, an afterthought. And um, they are just as much as part of our interscholastic program as anything else. But I thought this would be a great opportunity to show you what we're going to do within the recent guidelines that have been released that we can do um, for cheer fall cheering. And we're looking to get them together tomorrow, more of a little meet and greet. We'll go over protocols with them, Casey and I will. And, um, but one of the biggest things that, that they will be doing is skills and drills, but they won't be able to stunt. They won't be able to tumble. Um, they'll participate in conditioning. They'll do some jumps and they'll do create some dance routines. They'll be looking to possibly do the dance routines virtually more to come. It will be an uh, the activity will be outside. Um, fall cheering can't prepare for winter cheering, the competition season. The competition season is in the winter, and it's really that's the chance that the, the cheerleaders get to compete against other schools and, and go against each other with their routines. The MPA is fearful that if they start now, they'll start putting their routines together, and they can't do that. Um, We'll be working on school spirit items, uh, looking at the game schedule on who has games and try to promote positive school sp uh, spirit. Um, they're going to have a strong sense of community service. They've already tied into the parks and rec. We'll be contacting them and also our boosters organization on ways they can help with the virtual craft there. They're going much like football. They're going to use technology to lock in guest speakers. They're gonna connect with the elementary schools soon to talk about virtual bedtime, to look into bedtime stories with the kids. And one item with the, they, if they cheer at a fall contest and they do sideline cheering at a fall contest, I have to count them as part of the hundred. So, and I'll talk about that here in a second, but you know, if we have a field hockey event, we wanna have our cheerleaders there and we're at 93, you know, people for this event for field hockey, and we have 15 cheerleaders, they have to go into that equation as well. Um, something that I'd like to just reference on, and then I'll talk about what Marge spoke to, is we have two very 
an important components, not only at Wyndham High School with athletics, but our two middle schools as well. We have Jordan Small and Wyndham Middle. We're looking and, and in talking to Mr. Patton and Mr. Crockett, we're going to take a skills and drills approach. Uh, district coaches would still be involved in ministering the programs. Uh, we would still conduct signups and require physicals. We provide education on our protocols for COVID. We'd look for consistency at both schools. So really in looking at this, we want both schools on board to do this. We don't want to get in a position where we're pitting one against the other. Um, two conferences that they compete in, Jordan Small competes in the Cumberland County Conference. Most of that conference is going to a skills and drills format. The Wyndham Middle Schools in the Southern Maine Middle School Athletic Conference that league is mostly skills and drills as well. The daily sessions will be done by cohorts and we're looking to start towards the end of September and go through the end of October with the skills and drills. Those are some things that could change. Um, now to circle back a little bit to Marge's um, Marge's point about the executive order. Rich, could you do me a, oh, there we go. That's good to have you. So I just want to let everyone know, I'm running the Zoom meeting, but my Zoom has actually frozen and I'm not able to mute or unmute people or call on people. I'm going to go to a separate computer and start in from that one. If for some reason the meeting glitches or ends, we will be right on the same link. Uh, this is the first time this has happened to me in Zoom, and um, I'm going to try it again from a different machine. So I hope to see you in the conference room in a minute. Richie, keep going. Okay. All right. Um, so, Marge, to your point about the governor's executive order for a um, hundred people at events at mass gatherings outside in each guideline that was presented from the MPA which was made with um, input from state agencies each sport guideline references that we have to follow the hundred people for mass gatherings outside and if we look at this and the size of our school and the league that we compete in for our events, we have JV and varsity teams, which is a good thing. We have good numbers. Our, the bigger schools have um, bigger numbers. And so if you, for instance, I'll just give you a quick rundown and I'll pick on field hockey to start. They have some of the lower numbers, but if Wyndham High School combined has 37 field hockey players, and then you have, say, 37 to 40 for the visitors, right there you're at 80, okay? You throw in the coaches, five to six coaches total, each school. You throw in the trainer, the athletic director, a couple staff members, I'm going to have a police officer at fall events for contests, for varsity contests and JV contests. You throw in a media person, you throw in a timer, PA, and a video person. We're already at 91, 92 people. The issue is, is that, you know, to, to do this, we're going to be right at those numbers. And I've, I've had several emails from parents and I know I'm not the most popular person in Wyndham right now, but also as a league, I'd like to share as a league. As a league back on September 10th, this is something that we knew was going to be in the pipeline when we started looking back at this in May. And it's really, it's come to the point now to where it's here. It looks like we can return to play. Um, I don't want to say it's impossible 
to have fans at games because I know that there's many parents on this call right now that would love to see games. But to logistically do this, to abide by the guidelines, and to do what we're asked, and if we want to return to play for the kids, we have to follow the guidelines that are in place. And as a result of the guidelines that are in place, we made a motion as a league that we wouldn't allow fans at fall contest for the fall of 2020. So that's something, it, trust me, it would be much easier for me to, to say fans will be at games, um, but it's something that is logistically, it's, it's which parents do come, you know, and then, how do you rotate that? How do you, how do you get through it? Logistically, we don't even know visitors numbers and what it's going to look like. So I can field questions about that. I know that that's probably a hot topic and I don't mind trying to field and answer as many questions as I can. I think Kate, I thought I saw your hand go up. Yeah. Thanks Rich. Um, I really appreciate the summary. That was extremely helpful for me to have that, so I appreciate that. Um, I had an opportunity to observe um, today soccer, both um, boys and girls, and field hockey. And um, when it comes to your notion of a hundred hundred people is interesting and I totally get the ruling and I'm not I'm not fighting that I mean it is what it is when I was there I was say for the field hockey I was almost to the track entrance at that end of the the um, fence so I guess and when I was watching um, both the soccer games I was I was closer to the girls, but I was just up on the hill, you know, before the barrier. Um, they were down in the valley there. I guess my question is, and maybe I'm splitting hairs, is what, what is, how do you define um, participants geographically? In other words, I was, I, I was pretty far away for field hockey you know, just kind of on the other side of the fence. Do you have to be on the inside of the fence? Yeah, you, I know you know what I'm talking about. So can you help me understand that? Because I think that would be, um, and I think football is maybe easier, but that would be helpful for me. And I know parents, like, can you stand on the other side of the fence or whatever the deal is? Mm -hmm. So Kate, that's a great question. And that's one of the places where I'm at as far as how far do we want to go with this and we many athletic directors throughout the state has asked for uh, you know a little bit of clarification on that and we haven't gotten much and but what I'm getting and what I'm understanding is that if somebody is there and they're actively viewing and engaging and watching this event and being a part of it, they are part of the count. So if somebody comes up, for instance, our field hockey field is four feet high and there's a nice little road next to it where last year the parents leaned on, if they're actively up on that fence and watching the game, they're part of the hundred count. So that's gonna be tough to monitor, no? It's going to be very tough. Um, it's something that it's why a lot of schools are going to have police officers at games. And I hate to, to say that and take that extreme. But the other thing is, is I just recently read an article um, and it had to do with youth sports, but in another state, um, they were shut down because they went over the amount that they were allowed within their state. And that's where I don't want to go. I don't want to do everything right to get these kids back out on the surfaces. And then it's ruined because we're not following the rules as fans or as people who should or shouldn't be there. 
So what if you have, you add up all your people sharing the whole shebang mm -hmm. and you have five openings to get to a hundred. Mm -hmm. Well, according to our league rule, we have, um, we we're not going to have fans as a league, but also, um, you know, that's something that if the school board says, Hey, Rich, we're going to make this happen. I'd report to the league that, sorry, this is what Wyndham high school is going to do. And we're going to allow fans. But the problem with that Kate is which five do I pick? Which five do I create a rotating schedule? That's and a nightmare. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> and then daily I am checking with people and I turn into ticket master. Right. When, when my real job is, competitive return to play safely for the kids so i concur i agree thank you for the explanation you're welcome um rich what about having the videographer at games the videographer is part of the count uh jenny and we have to count that person um we've been lucky um that um, mr howell has supported and endorsed uh, the school to buy equipment to live stream games which is great the the problem with that is um it's covid and everything's backed up because every school in the country is jumping at this so we won't be up and running to um live stream games for probably four to five weeks but i will work with any and any parent that is willing to take this on they can facebook live they can create a youtube channel and I would work with them to live stream those games. They would have to be part of the hundred. Um, the other thing with that is um, I would work with that person. I'm not looking into sports commentating during the game. I'm just looking at streaming. Mm -hmm. And I've already had a couple parents identified from boys soccer and girls soccer that would love to take that on. Great. I think that's a good compromise. Are there any questions uh, from any school board members? Any comments from school board members? Mrs. Bricks. Rich, can you help me um, understand the face mask requirement for um, players? I get that the coaches and all the other people are required to wear them, but I'm not, when I, when I hear rigorous activity, I, I don't understand it quite yet. Yep. So when, when the kids in the sports specific guidelines, when they're um, engaged in rigorous, vigorous, uh, any type of activity to where they're becoming, um, their heart rate's getting up and they're, they're breathing heavily, they can take their masks off. And, but if they're talking with a coach, talking with Casey, interacting, um, player to player, doing chalk talk, any type of instruction where that's not involved, they have to have the mask on. I was surprised to see on Monday, we went over this with uh, the kids, the coaches went over it with the kids, we went over it with the coaches, but during a lot of skills and drills, the kids have kept their masks on during play. And it's really, if they wanna do that, they, they're absolutely, they can do it. Um, what I really think it's a sign of, Kate, with the kids keeping their masks on so much, I think it's a sign of how bad they want it and how bad they want to be involved and how bad they and how happy they are to be back that they're willing to go over and beyond to have an opportunity to play. Um, one other thing when I talk about masks, um, we've had some beautiful signs put out by each of the fields. Um, and all of the sign work actually in the district has been magnificent. So kudos to the district and whoever put that together. Um, I noticed that the signs say you, so if there's no fans and there's no participants, but the, but, but the sign says you must wear a mask or we, and you must keep six feet distance. <laughs> When I see those, it's like, well, what is it? What is it? Is it 
is it for the is it for the participants or is it for the you know i'm confused by the signage who is that for yeah it's really kate and it's a it's it's it is confusing um but one of the things that we had to do and and to return to play is we had to provide signage and some different things you know for communication purposes we're still going to have um possibly a member of the media um game personnel showing up a timer a pa person that we still have to social distance and still they still have to hand san, hand sanitize and do those things and technically even kate on the sidelines when the kids aren't involved in activity they're required to social distance on the sidelines so our field crew has been phenomenal um, in this return to play and what they've done if you've walked the fields um, if you've walked the fields there's white dots all over the fields six feet apart so when the kids show up and they show up and they put their belongings on their dot and that's their home for the next hour and a half so we still have the signage out to remind people when they're not engaged that they still have to abide by those things okay great they're beautiful signs. Thank you. Thank you. March. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to say this. Um, and I know, I mean, it's very obvious between the last presentation and this presentation that you folks have gone through a lot, a lot of time, a lot of effort and a lot of trouble to make things happen for these students and to be able to bring athletics in. But I, I mean, this is going to be a me statement. Um, there was a lot of angst trying to get the kids back in school. Um, what can we do? What is the best thing to do? What will work? And all of these rules that came down were all put in place in the school. Now, when we look at athletics, going back to Kate's comment on signs, it basically does not apply in that manner that it applies to everybody else to the athletes when they're playing it's somewhat a different set of rules um and i'm really very nervous about throwing one more thing into the mix until the kids have been in school for a while and that we feel comfortable that yes we can make sure that they're getting a good education without them getting sick hopefully so and this again is a me statement it's kind of like i am extremely nervous about taking one more thing and putting it into that mix that could possibly get some child sick and i know everybody's got the best intentions and i totally get the well-rounded child I'm a, I'm a firm believer in that but this whole thing of doing it this soon after we've put the kit just put them all back in school I think it is a little unsettling. You don't have to answer that because I, I know I know where you're all coming from and I get it, but I wanted to put my feelings out there as to how I feel about that. But I want to thank you all. I mean, you've done a lot of work, a lot of work to make things happen for these kids, things that they really need. And I and I do get it. So thank you. Thanks. I can just, I can just say, Marge. Um, I hear you and I totally respect and under understand one thing just to keep in mind is that if there's no sports for these kids at the high school level or even at the middle school level in regards to skills and drills, these kids are still going to play sports and they're still going to travel and they're going to travel at great lengths and at great lengths it's defined by out of state and the biggest thing about returning to play, and it does go hand in hand with the school experience, which we all agree with, but also um, we've had some coaches go through some pretty extensive training and everything. So if there is interscholastic athletics, I think, and I know people agree that they're with people that at least have the knowledge and the education, the training to kind of be you know, to, to get them through this and to provide a little bit safer environment. So um, that's not a rebuttal necessarily to your point, I understand, but it's just a, 
another perspective as well. Thank you. Um, I have a question, and that is, what happens if um, the rules aren't followed? Well, Jenny, if the rules aren't followed, we would be definitely jeopardizing return to play. We could be shut down, and uh, this is something that's not going to be, you know, you, you get a slap on the wrist. If we don't do this right, it's not going to last long. So my point is, um, who, who is the follow the rules police at the games, for example? Yeah. I'll be at every home contest. Um, there'll be an officer at every home contest. Not that I would put that officer in that position to do my job, but if there was something that got to the point to where um, it got a little ugly, I'd have the Mr. or Lady in Blue step in and help me out. We have a certified athletic trainer who will be on site, and uh, we have coaches who are medically uh, have credentials through the state of Maine to, to help as well. So, so if, there's, um, if there's a violation that the, that the teams do or the other teams do, will, that, will the coaches have the responsibility to say, I'm sorry, we can't play under these conditions and forfeit or... It, it could come to that. You know, if a school came to Wyndham and they felt uncomfortable, Jenny, with kind of how we handle game management and everything, they absolutely could hop on a bus and go home. Okay. And that's why the, the pressure is really on Casey and I to go over meet and greet protocols and our expectations. And really all our opponents before they come to Wyndham will get that ahead of time. To, <clears throat> to excuse me, to know kind of where we stand with with items as far as game management. And the same for us, if we go to a school and find that it doesn't meet our standards, we stop. It, it very well, yes. Okay. Yep. Um, Mrs. Bricks has her hand raised. Thank you. Um, forgive me if you've mentioned this, but for example, and it doesn't matter what sport, and we have, say, four other schools or three other schools that we will compete with. And um, we've played one of those schools, and they have had an outbreak in that school. What is the protocol then for our district? Yep. If one of our opponents has had a outbreak, Kate, we and we've played them once and we're scheduled to play them again. If they've been shut down or it, we wouldn't be playing, we wouldn't be playing the game. And um, it's something that even if, say, they've been shut down, but they've reopened, that might be something that I talked to Mr. Howell about to get his feedback on to if we're going to play you know, that contest, even though maybe they've been cleared to, to play. And uh, we could play somebody in the end of September and we're not scheduled to play them until the end of October where there's a six week window. Um, that's definitely something. But the one thing that the communication between the athletic directors is vital about that. And that's where um, we will, I, I, I can't say, Kate, it won't happen, but um, I just can't imagine that if there was an outbreak at a school that that wouldn't be communicated to other host schools that we'd be participating with. Yeah, no, and I agree. That's, that's not kind of where I'm going. So we play Gorham, whatever team, doesn't matter. And um, within two weeks, we find out that the team we, we played had players or whoever was associated with that game test positive. Okay. And then our students then thus have been exposed. Mm -hmm. So what would be our protocol for that? Kate, I actually have, and I have a copy on my desk, which I've had a chance to read, which is the standard operating procedure from Maine CDC for schools in any sort of a case or outbreak. And there's a section under after school activities 
that defines what close contact is, which is anyone with more than 15 minutes of cumulative contact will be considered to be a close contact with an individual. So I think we'd have to go back to what was the game situation, who actually was in contact, and work with our school nurses to say, was it a cumulative close contact or um, does it actually rise to the level where we have to put a group of students in the quarantine or not? I guess that what I'm circling around and um, listen, I've had, I've had kids who play varsity. I know how important sports, uh, sports is for students. Um, I get it. I get the social emotional. I get the connection. I get all of it. Um, and I'm a cheerleader, although I wasn't really a cheerleader, but I am in this case, I am a cheerleader for anything sports. I'm, I know we're not deliberating right now, but I, I want to express that, um, this isn't just about teams. This isn't just about sports because these students come back into our schools. For example, the Gorham example, and two days after they played, um, we find out that they've been exposed, but in the meantime, it's very conceivable that they've had one, if not more, in school instructions if they're not doing virtual. And so I am hugely wrestling with um, not just this, this is a whole school for me decision because it, it could impact the entire school. Um, and I'm just weighing the risks versus the benefits and I'm really, really struggling. Um, and I know I'm singing to the choir to a lot of people, and I know a lot of people don't like this comment, but um, my job as a school board member is the safety of all students in the district. And so I'm really weighing the risk. Thank you. Miss hey. Cummings, Jenny Butler had her hand up. Okay, Jenny. So, Rich, when are the first contests scheduled to start, or do you know that yet? No, I do, Jenny. Um, they would start um, a week from this Friday. We're looking to start on the 25th of September. So there's still, my point is, there's still definitely time to get everybody all on board to know what's going on, and, yep. and uh, great, great. Any other school board member want to make a comment? I mean, want to ask a question? Okay, we'll now move to the, um, to anybody who wants to speak in the uh, audience. If you would like uh, a chance to speak, please raise your hand. And um, Ms. Frostberg today will call on you and uh, we'll let you, We'll have you unmute then and speak. So, just so everyone everyone knows, under the participants tab on your bottom of your screen, there's actually a spot where you can raise your hand. Sorry, I should have said that. That's okay. <laughs> so, if you see that, there's a little blue hand that comes up that tells us that you want to speak, and we're doing that so that we can get you in order. And if not, I know Kathy Pepin wants to speak because I just saw her hand. Yes. Why don't we start with Kathy? Thank you. Um, Rich, I want to commend you a lot for how much work you have done. Um, being a registered nurse myself, I understand the risks. Um, fortunately, I, I'm lucky I am not in the hospital at this point. I am. Um, but I do do a lot of disability and I read about COVID 24-7. Um, you know, my daughter has been a soccer player since she's been four years old. This is extremely difficult for me and I know all our seniors, we have been together since U9. And so, you know, this really kills us that we can't watch, but we're trying to be strong about this. We, um, but to listen to some of the comments, you have to remember the mental health of these athletes, no matter what they are. Yes. These kids have been together the whole summer. 
They have played sports the whole summer. They have hung out the whole summer. Not one of the kids that I know of or in, have been in contact with COVID. The, the rate of COVID with kids is pretty low. The rate of our whole state is very low. I get your um, angst about, you know, protecting the whole school, but everybody goes to Walmart, everybody goes to Hannaford's, everybody's out and about. So it's not just the sports that we should be worried about, bringing it back, the athletes bring it back into our classroom. We're all out living. And so to me, it's just, it's, I'm trying not to cry, sorry. I, it's just frustrating to hear um, and I understand that you're trying to get all the sides down, but as a parent, as a nurse, and, you know, as somebody who may be involved in the school board someday, I advocate that sports is important for the kid that's socially awkward, the kid that needs that family with Coach Perkins, because Coach Perkins is the only person who is a father figure to him. And that's maybe they're in a, they don't even have a parent, but they have that as their community. They have that as their family. That's huge. And to take that away because we're worried and we're scared is so hard. And I'll shut up. So sorry. I don't want to take too much time. <laughs> I'm sorry, thanks, Kathy. I was muting because my dog was barking. Um, anyone else? Christine? Kate Levier. Kate Levier, please. I didn't. I didn't know if we wanted the public to talk first before it was just there was a pause, so I, I jumped in. But okay. I don't know if you want the public to talk first, Jenny. Um, if you're if you're making a comment, then hold it until the okay. public is first. Yeah, that's and that's totally fine. Okay, thanks. Um, any public that wants to opine or ask a question? Um, Meredith Millett. Good evening, everyone. Um, I definitely want to mirror what Kathy said. Kathy, thank you so much. Um, we all so much appreciate everything. Um, the school board and the athletic um, team is, is doing to try to get the sports for our kids. Um, I did just have a quick question about the spectators. And I know it's, it's very sensitive for all of us. It's very hard, especially for the kids that are not necessarily playing in college. Uh, this is it for them and our last time to see them play. Um, same with Kathy, I'm trying not to get choked up. So my question about the spectators, um, the hundred in the area is a little bit um, confusing to me. Um, could you just explain to me again, the, the MPA's guidelines versus what's on the main.gov page, explaining that spectators are looked at separately than the athletes. Um, they're really, they're, their view of a gathering is that, you know, in a sports event or a concert type situation that you can have 50 people per side, provided that there's separate entrances and bathrooms. Um, why is it that the MPA is counting the hundred um, with spectators and athletes included? I'm just curious how that came to be instead of counting them as two separate gatherings since the spectators are not near the athletes necessarily. Thank you. So Meredith, that's a good question. So when, when this was developed, these guidelines, they were, the guidelines were developed with the MPA in the conjunction of many of the state agencies. And these are the guidelines that we have to follow. There are other guidelines, there's community youth sport guidelines, there's other guidelines that are out there that allow 200 spectators. If you break them up 50, 50 and 50, but you need separate restrooms for how you break them up, there's all kinds of different things. Um, and I had this conversation with a parent the other day I can't necessarily look at those other guidelines. I can only deal with the guidelines that are imposed upon us. Um, so if I was to look and, and try to 
persuade the MPA and these state agencies to bring in these other guidelines. It, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. Um, the hundred people, it's players, coaches, fans, that's in that equation. And I, I'm very sympathetic to how you guys feel. I get it. Um, but also if we deviate any bit from that, it's going to jeopardize return to play for the kids. I know that's not the answer you want to hear, but. Chris McKenna. Chris McKenna. Hi, I'm just curious, like if you had talked before about accommodating the other team's numbers, our numbers, staff, and then if we still had some left over, which I kind of think in some of the sports we will, because on average, some teams are like 20, um, at most 20 a roster. So you're looking at maybe like 20 leftover spots. And if that were to be something that was considered, it would be really nice to consider the senior parents just because this is their last year and, and the other kids are going to have opportunities in the future, hopefully, and their parents will have the opportunities to watch them. I would just hope that would be considered. It's a great point, Dana, and I appreciate the comment. The, the numbers that I've uh, initially crunched on field hockey, girls soccer, and, foot, and boys soccer, right now I'm at 105 for boys soccer. And I'm going to have to look at that and, and meet the guidelines. Girls soccer tentatively is at 95 and field hockey is at 90-ish. Um, the thing is, in picking the senior parents, and I get it, it's your last year, but also if I just allow senior parents and I'm going to have a sophomore parent saying, why isn't their experience just as important as the senior year? Um, I, I totally understand. And Dana, you... And the other parents who have spoke, you would be the first ones that I call if anything changes or if we can do something differently within the rules, I'll do it. Because trust me, I don't want to deal with this. But the thing is, I'd much rather let them all in, but um, I have to follow the guidelines. Thank you. I don't see any other names. I don't see any other names. Uh, Pete Small. Uh, yes, hello. I, 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 uh, I speak tonight as a parent of two, uh, two students in the, in the district, one at the high school and one at uh, the middle school. Um, I, would, uh, I would love to see that the school board um, approve the plan as presented this evening for really a couple of reasons. One, I think the schools opened up under state guidelines that were put together by uh, the, the, the uh, Department of Education in conjunction with the CDC. And, and they've also put together these guidelines in conjunction with the MPA and the CDC, the Department of Education. Um, and I think those, those agencies looked at these guidelines for a number of weeks, delayed openings, sat down and had a number of talks and said, how can we do this uh, safely, um, thinking of the health of the students as well as the communities at large. Um, and so those guidelines make, being brought down to the schools, I think um, present a plan that then I think our, our school district has done a tremendous job in saying, how do we safely implement these, these plans? Um, a second reason is, and I think it was one that was mentioned by somebody previously this evening, is we have seen students and student athletes participating outside of school in other functions. And I don't say that because, well, if they're participating in those functions, they should be participating at the school. I think by, by drawing them in to participate at the school, they will be participating under safer guidelines than are being done at the state level. And so to have the student athletes and, and, and students themselves participating under the guidance of a plan that I believe is, is more stringent than the state level, I think what we're actually looking for is people who can guide, work with, encourage, promote um, athletics in a very safe manner. And to do that within the school, I think actually what we're doing is helping our community 
more so than per potentially providing um, any exposure in a dangerous way. So again, I, I, I would hope that the board would really consider these guidelines and certainly consider the fact that I, I think the guidelines being put together by the same state agencies that put together the guidelines for school opening um, and the overall safety of the program. So thank you. Thanks, Pete. I'm waiting for anyone else to raise their hands. It doesn't look like there's anybody. Um, okay, person with the Golden Gate Bridge behind him. Yes, hello, uh, my name is Ron Gabbery. Uh, I have a, uh, a son who plays soccer. Uh, he's on the boys team, the boys varsity team. I guess one of the things that I wanted to say uh, and, and just get, get across here is how safe I feel that my, that my son is in participating in the, uh, in the sports uh, at Wyndham High School. And, and on top of that, uh, hearing more information from Mr. Drummond and the, the effort that they've gone through to make this safe and, uh, and available to the kids is, it just makes me feel even more confident in my statement. So I just wanna make sure that the board understands that as a parent uh, of, a, of a child that attends Wyndham High School and participates in, in these extracurricular activities, I feel uh, very safe and very comfortable knowing that, that they are being looked after and all of the COVID protocols are being followed uh, to every degree that's possible to, to make these things available. So just wanted to make that point uh, and uh, make sure that people understood that. Thank you. It looks like we have a lot of people who are positive about um, wanting the sports to speak. Is there, I mean, sports to uh, go out forward. Are, is there anybody in um, the audience who has a differing opinion? Thank you. It's now time for uh, the board to have a discussion and deliberate. So we will do so. Um, Kate Levier, would you like to start? Yeah, thank you. Um, first, I wanna thank everyone for their, their comments earlier. They were, they were very good. Um, I would say I'm, I'm really, um, without repeating what others have said, I, I very much agree with what Pete Small and, and Kathy said. Um, I think we need to realize that Rich is totally right. These, these kids are going to find a way to play sports um, no matter what. Um, I have a child who's been playing soccer since July or August. Um, and I, the, the rules and regulations that they've had, I, I have not once felt concerned about them, but I will also tell you that they are not as stringent as what Rich has presented to us tonight. So I think we do need to realize that, that these kids, one, they, they absolutely need this outlet um, and that they um, are being held to very, very strict um, standards to keep them safe. So. Um, if, if we did vote to not have this move forward, I would be more concerned about other places that were, they were going. I know there was even some football that had happened, um, not school related, uh, but some travel football where students had even gone into Massachusetts and then quarantined for 14 days at, their, at a coach's house. So they're doing a really, really good job to make sure that we can continue to have these opportunities for their kids. So I would just encourage people to, to think about the kids and all the guidelines that are in place. Thank you. Anyone else want to speak on the boards? I have. Okay, then I would like to echo um, what Pete said, I think if the um, if they're following state guidelines, obviously they have the by they I mean the athletic people have um, put so much thought and um, and basically done a flow chart about this will happen, then this will happen, then this will happen, and I appreciate that. Um, and I echo, as I said, Pete's position and Kathy Pepin's position. 
um, about wanting to see um, their children um, succeed at something that, that feeds them. Um, for my brother, it was, um, it was football and baseball. For me, it was drama. So uh, both of us would have had a tough time if we didn't have those outlets. So um, I would like to ask, and I don't want to put her on the spot, but um, I wonder if Molly, who is an athlete, can talk to us about your opinion. Um, yeah, so I have been thinking about this throughout the day, and um, I'd like to say that I'm just very happy to have a season, whether my parents can come watch or not. Um, having that outlet after school every day, getting to go be with my teammates finally and have that. I mean, I don't have very many friends in my classes, but I can go see them after school. So although I know my parents can't come watch my final season of cross country, um, I'm just happy to be able to possibly race and be part of that team again. And I'm sure a lot of other students feel the same way. Thanks, Molly. I appreciate your insight. All right, are we, does anybody else want to speak? Or are we ready to move on to a vote? I want to remind everybody that our vote is to authorize Chris to oversee the implementation of the scholastic athletics program. So we're really authorizing him to enrich, basically, to be the point people on this. And um, personally, I feel comfortable doing that. Mrs. Bricks. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate, uh, but I would like to hear Chris's take on this as the superintendent. Um, I'm a nervous Nelly. <laughs> That's my nature. So um, I appreciate, I mean, I'm a parent. I appreciate your perspective. It, it would probably kill me if when my kids were seniors that I couldn't watch them, um, but it would be more important for me to, for them to play. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, <sighs> I guess my lens is, and I hear everybody say they're playing outside and, and I respect that and I know that, that's a parent decision. Mm -hmm. um, that's not my decision. That's a parent decision that folks are playing, you know, beyond the school um, teams. And, and I think it's fabulous. I mean, I do know that it's possible to play both. You. Uh, I'm not sure that just because we have school teams that people won't still play outside of school because my kids did. Um, maybe that's different now, but you can, you can be on an AU team or whatever, after school team, rec team, whatever, and still be on a school team. Um, I just wanna be very clear that I, I just really take the responsibility of all of our student safety. Mm -hmm. Um, so seriously, um, I know from the bottom of my heart how important sports are. I mean, uh, my comments in no way imply that I don't understand the importance of sports because I do, um, but I'm, I probably won't know until the very last minute. So, but I would appreciate um, Chris, who will be, other than Rich, who has been in the trenches, and I know this has been an unbelievable, unbelievable journey of A, not knowing what's happening, and B, trying to put all the pieces together. And I, I just want to compliment you. I think you've done a stellar job, just superb. So I'm going to leave it up to Mr. Howell to um, hear what his thoughts are. Sure, and I, I'll share that I'm coming as your superintendent, but also as the parent of a junior athlete. Um, so first of all, I'll go from the uh, superintendent lens, which is Rich and I have had a chance to meet almost daily for the last three weeks on uh, the preparations that are being made for the possible start of athletics. And um, I will very much admit that I shared many of the same concerns 
And I, I guess really what really started to change my mind on a couple different things is that one, um, I had a chance to visit the first day of preseason on Monday. And it was actually almost a funny story where Rich was talking to one of the teams down in the lower bowl, bowl field and said, people are watching, they wanna see what you're doing and they wanna make sure that you're doing things right. And um, even the superintendent, and just as I did that, I think I was driving by the field. Uh, so the kids saw my truck and Rich was able to point up and say, you needed to do that. And I think every kid to the person was actually wearing a mask during all the different field work on the day, first day of preseason. Um, so initially, I mean, right off from the bat, I saw that kids were taking it seriously. Uh, the other thing that Rich and I have spent a lot of time talking on is that are we actually prepared, much like for the opening of school, do we have the signage, do we have the PPE, is everybody trained, and, and, and everyone was adequately trained for that. And, and the last piece that really sold it for me was um, the guidelines that were created. I, I'll be honest, I was very disappointed with the MPA when the initial guidelines came out. And basically it was the MPA making guidelines and not being fully and succinct with Maine CDC and Maine Department of Health and Human Services. And, and we have, as a state, have done really well. We've depended on DHHS, and there's actually an independent arm of DHHS that actually sets all these guidelines. We've depended on them for school opening, for business opening, and they've also um, given their okay to athletics opening. And so for me, it's if we've trusted them to do all these other parts and they've gotten us to this point, then, then I can trust them for that. Now, speaking as a parent, uh, had a junior who participated in a virtual season, actually would have been a sophomore then, virtual season in the spring. He is a competitive sailor, has to wear a mask on a sailboat with two kids. And when you dump and land in seawater and now your mask is full of seawater and you still have to wear it, he'll still wear it knowing that he's gonna have a season. And I think our kids are taking it seriously. Uh, the last piece that I'll just share, which is that if we're not taking it seriously and it becomes unsafe, um, I think we need to be very clear with teams that their play will be suspended until we can put all the proper protocols in place um, because the impact of the season will have an impact on school and the impact of the season will also have an impact on whether or not that there's a winter season and then possibly a spring season. Uh, my last point would be, uh, you know, I've thought a lot about incidental contact between students on the field. I've also know from my high school experience, a number of kids that are holding jobs at uh, fast food places at Hannaford, at Lowe's, at other places where they're coming into incidental contact with people all the time. They may not be slide tackling them um, or having those close connections, but there's many, many connections. So I feel comfortable making the recommendation that we start with the guidelines that have been put in front of us. Um, I do think as a board, as additional guidance comes out, because this has been so sports focused tonight, uh, but the other extracurriculars that fall under the MPA, such as the drama festivals, the music festivals, um, I, I think we're going to have to have some further discussions down the road, what those might look like, um, and participation, whether or not we can. But I feel comfortable recommending athletics the way they've been presented and what's been put into place to all of you tonight. Okay, thank you. Are we ready to call for a vote? Okay. Mr. Howell, all those in favor? March Gavoni? I'm sorry, but I'm just not comfortable with that. I have to say no. Kate Briggs? Yes. Kate Levier? Yes. Jenny Butler? Yes. Jenny Cummings? Aye. Scott McLean? 100% yay. Christina Small? No. Have I missed anybody? Me. My boxes no. aren't where they normally Anna are. Anna Keeney. Anna Keeney, there you are, Anna. Your face isn't there. Anna Keeney. No. So that's three opposed and Five, four. Yep. So the motion carries.
Okay, could I have a motion about the lease purchase of the fourth level? But first, thank you, Rich. Thank all the coaches. Please, thanks, um, um, Casey. Thank you all for showing up and, and for the time that you're giving to this process. Hey, Jenny, just real quick. I, you know, some people threw some thank yous my way, but really we have a COVID athletic response team and that's Carrie Jolly and Casey Sinclair and Phil Rossetti. So it's, it was really a, a team effort to create the guidelines that the kids are operating under or the protocols, I should say, for our school. So I just wanted to reference that because they, they helped me a lot. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you too, Will I Am. He'll know what I'm talking about. Um, so could I have a motion, please? Christina? I move to authorize the superintendent to enter into the financing agreement for the lease purchase of the awarded bid for one floor scrubber through Androscoggin Savings Bank at $24,106.50 at 1.64% amortized over three years at an annual cost of $8,166.56. Should that be in the best interest of the district pursuant to 20A MRSA subsection 4013 in the format presented? Second. Who seconded it? Marge? It's been moved and seconded by Marge. Um, any public comment? Mr. Howell, do you want to speak to it? To sure, I'm excited so many people stuck around for a floor scope for purchase, <laughs> which is fantastic. Um, but this is to purchase a floor scrubber for Wyndham High School and the process now currently for anyone who wants to know a little fun fact, Wyndham High School is a little over five acres of floor space. So think about cleaning that um, every single day and all the different hallways and everything that goes along with that. Uh, this is a machine that will actually scrub the floors and sweep them at the same time, speeding up the amount of time. Our custodians right now are under a tremendous amount of pressure to clean buildings, to turn things over. This will save at least four hours of time for at least one employee, two employees actually, because two people have to run separate machines in cleaning that building. Um, and this is a budgeted item um, from last year's budget. So. Okay. Um, why are we, um, th it, this is a purchase. So it's a lease and then purchase. It's a lease purchase and we only budgeted a payment. We didn't budget the full amount of the 24,000. Okay, thank you. Um, any uh, public comment about Could you all please put yourself on mute? Any, thank you. Um, so any um, discussion from the public about this riveting spot? Any board discussion? Scott? Yeah, um, I initially read this and so this is a budgeted item. Um, it, this is not being covered by uh, COVID relief funds. Is that correct, Chris? That's correct. And um, anything that's in your budget and was planned as a budget can't be supplanted by COVID relief. So even though it's being used for cleaning, it was a planned purchase, we can't um, supplant and, and swap it over. Okay. And then I just have one other question. How many other floor scrubbers do we have for the high school? Don't we have one other one? What I was told by Mr. Hansen when I did my floor scrubber investigation this afternoon is we actually have two machines that are currently doing the, the job of this one. One does the sweeping and one does the water catching. This one will do both at the same time. Um, so it's combining two machines into one. So theoretically now you could have three machines going throughout the high school. Um, speeding things up. Okay, so you're not planning on retiring the other two machines? Nope. Okay. And they're all, they're all big battery powered and um, we'll continue to use them. But again, anything we can do to speed things up because the amount of sanitization that's going on right now and cleaning um, as soon as school gets out is tremendous at the moment. So um, this will definitely help out the custodians. All right. And then can you shoot me an email when you get that thing? I want to try it out. <laughs> Get it, get it, get it in line. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other board members want to make a comment or ask a question? 
All right, all those in favor? Marge Gavoni? Yes. Kate Bricks? Yes. Kate Levying? Yes. Jenny Butler? Yes. Jenny Cummings? Aye. Christina Small? Yes. Scott McLean? Yay. Anna Keeney? Yes. Okay, the motion carries. Um, now we'll have the superintendent's report. Sure, I have a couple things that I wanna share with you tonight. Um, first of all, I'll start out with the final um, approval by the commissioner came through today for the Raymond withdrawal agreement. And um, for those of you who have been following this along, there's an agreement that has to be negotiated between the two communities prior to the vote so that both communities know what will happen after consolidation or after not consolidation after withdrawal and so the commissioner has given her final nod to that document uh, in addition she has set the election date as of november 3rd for when the citizens of raymond will have the opportunity to decide whether or not that they want to withdraw from rsu 14. Uh, just remind the public that tomorrow september 17th at noon public has the opportunity to attend an in-person meeting from, to hear from the withdrawal committee uh, for Raymond September 22nd in the evening at Jordan Small Middle School and then on September 28th via Zoom. And I just would say to the public is that as facts and other things are being sent out that they please check to make sure that everything is correct and that they're uh, making sure that they are fully informed prior to going in that vote on the 3rd and any members of the community who have any questions, feel free to either me, email me, email me, or Christine frost and we'd be happy to answer your questions or send you any documents that you need to help you make your decision. Um, also wanted to talk tonight about the strategic plan. It's been a while since we've had a chance to talk about it on the board. And um, interestingly enough, it was the last public meeting that we held as an RSU. We did a session with Michelle Milstein big community kickoff on, I think it was March 3rd for our new strategic plan. And um, sadly, March 13th, things started to be shut down and we didn't have the opportunity to move much further with the public. Um, we have been running a steering committee um, over the summer. Kate Bricks has been our board representative on that and had a chance to meet with us over the summer. Uh, we have a larger committee that's being developed now. And so we're continuing to plan into the fall with some virtual events and some virtual uh, meetings with community members, with students, with teachers to gain more information. Um, our original timeline that we'd hoped for was that we would have our community gathering in March, we'd work over the summer, we'd have our initial community goals for the start of school and then December that we'd be off and running with our new strategic plan or present it to the board. We're gonna have to push that off a little bit into late winter by the time that we're finished. Um, for like everything else, COVID made it very difficult to meet and to gather groups together. Uh, Christine Frostbert and I and, I and Christine Hesser were meeting Friday with our, uh, with Michelle Milstein, who's helping to facilitate. And I'll be sending out a schedule to the board with some upcoming dates once that that's finalized. But just to let you know, we haven't forgotten about strategic planning. That is something that still we are all passionate about. And um, as we get by school opening, it's something we want to put our energy definitely back into. A uh, couple pieces of exciting news or one piece of exciting news is back in June, I was able to announce to all of you that we'd received a COP grant for $120,000 to support a school resource officer at Windham Middle School in Jordan Small. Uh, late last week, received notification for a second COPS grant uh, in the amount of $472,000 to go to RSU 14. And that will be everything from additional SRO time to additional police uh, support. It will also include upgrades to our security system, outdoor speaker systems for evacuations so that people can communicate and upgraded card readers. Uh, so we're pretty excited that between the two, uh, $592,000 to put into school security in RSU 14. Uh, I wanna thank uh, Matt Sear, Officer Fournier, Christine frost uh, Lynette Hain, and also the support we received from Mike Duffy and the entire Wyndham Police Department for helping us with that grant. They will actually be the fiscal agent, um, but $592,000 is a fantastic way to support. Put that on top of the additional um, 
two and a half million that we received through revolving renovation, which over a million of that will be putting updates to security systems at Jordan Small and Raymond Elementary. Uh, it's fantastic to be receiving all of this money. And lastly, Rich, and I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be announcing this, but you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and do it anyway, um, is that we were contacted by a member of the community and we're contacted who has some connections with some of our uh, local construction companies who have been great supports and partners throughout the year. And um, we will have a sand volleyball court uh, located on campus. Um, where I think Rich, the breaking ground, we thought it was gonna be Saturday, but I think it's gonna be Monday and hoping for a very tight timeline to have this done. It is a very generous gift to the RSU. Uh, Rich and I and Bill, I think that was last night, Rich, that we did a little campus scouting and it's determined that it will be on the far end of the um, stadium. So if you're looking towards, if you're in the concession stand, you look to the far end, there's a fence, a small fence that's at the edge of the track and then a larger fence on the access road. There's a little spot there, it's a strip of grass where absolutely nothing exists right now and there aren't any plans. We know there aren't any utilities, there's no drainage issues. Um, and um, our, one of our local contractors was meeting Bill, I think actually tonight to walk the site. And I think we might even have some machinery here on Saturday, but the latest on Monday, starting to break ground for uh, a sand volleyball court so that our volleyball kids who can't practice indoors can start at least working on some skills outdoors. So a very generous gift and just big thank you to our community for thinking of us stepping up. Um, our goal, because everyone knows I'm competitive, Falmouth built theirs in six days. I think we can do it in three. <laughs> <laughs> so um, may we uh, publicize the um, person who came up with the idea and is, head is heading it? I wanna actually check with that person, Jenny, before we do that, just to make sure. Um, I know the board is aware, but I'm not sure if that person necessarily wants it to be public okay. of what they're doing, but if that's the case, we also definitely want to recognize um, our community partners. I know uh, Timmy Tanberg from Tanberg will be doing the excavation work and has already agreed to do that. And um, Tanberg has been a great partner for us. They helped us with our, um, sewage treatment plant this summer. They've also helped with a lot of our campus earthwork and um, I'm just very thankful of them donating time with their equipment and um, their personnel to make this happen for our kids. Um, it's great to have community partners. Thank you, it is, it is remarkable and wonderful and the fact that it happened so fast is amazing. So, thank you. Um, could I have a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. Okay. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded by Kate. All those in favor? March Gavoni? Yes. Kate Bricks? Yes. Kate Levier? Yes. Jenny Butler? Yes. Jenny Cummings? Aye. Christina Small? Yes. Scott Ooh. McLean? Yay. Anna Keeney? Hey, check your, check your uh, newspaper thing tomorrow. Okay. Um, I want to say that it's very exciting to me to say that I won't see any of you for two weeks. Because oh, I was going to ask you where you were going, but it's been so, <laughs> we've, been, we've been doing this for so long. <laughs> I know. So have a nice vacation. <laughs> yeah. We'll Thank see you. you. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night, all.